with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good morning, Dan and Amy. And in for Amy this morning is podcaster Carol Roth, The Roth Effect. She's also a regular Fox Business contributor and author. Carol, uh, interesting uh, proposal by President Trump to give sanctuary city Democrats and some Republicans, certainly in states like Illinois, who voted for it, exactly what they want. Yeah, it was like Christmas came early this year that they put it on their list. They said, this is what we want. And he said, great, I'm going to deliver that right to your door. It's an opportunity, I would say, for places like Chicago, Cook County, Illinois, other big cities governed by Democrats for generations to prove up their superior model of governance. This is what they wanted. They want open borders. That's what many of their leading lights for president in 2020 have said explicitly. Julian Castro The way that you deal with people coming in this country illegally is to stop making it illegal. (laughs) Beto, Beto, uh, Beto O'Rourke, tear down the walls that are up in El Paso where I live. Okay. I mean, let's just establish the baseline of their position so you can assess it in terms of President Trump's response. Here's Beto, Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro, Kamal Harris, Kristen Gillibrand in order. If you could, would you take the wall down now, here? Yes. Like you have a wall. Absolutely. Knock it down. Offer a home to refugees. That is who we are. That's our values. That's part of what we do. So instead of building a wall or closing the border, we should choose compassion instead of cruelty. We welcome refugees and bring people out of the shadows. Immigration is not a security issue. It is an economic and a humanitarian and a family issue. There is no such thing as an illegal human. Mm. And you've had uh, Democrat mayors respond. Mayor-elect here, Lori Lightfoot, said, yep, sure, bring them in. You know who's changed her tune on that? No pun intended, is Cher. Um, Not an elected official yet. Not an elected official, but as we know, a major policy wonk. Oh, yes. And uh, she basically said... Uh, I understand helping struggling immigrants, but my city isn't taking care of its own and goes on to make the exact argument that we've all been making for years, that there are people who are citizens who were not taken care of, vets and the like, and she doesn't understand why we're not prioritizing those people over illegal immigrants. Well, another actual uh, Democrat mayor, big city, Jenny Durkin, who's the mayor of Seattle, has not been in the Washington Post. Seattle isn't afraid of immigrants, Mr. Trump. Yeah, this is their response. Like they if, always, conf- they like to conflate the illegal immigrants with actual immigrants. Which well, they is al- super offensive. They also suggest that um, the rule of law is a suggestion you're afraid of anyone. No, <laughs> um, but ironically, <laughs> Jenny Durkin, mayor of Seattle, um, March 14th, Seattle's ABC affiliated uh, Como news station, KOMO. is uh, the uh, the 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 hour long special. Seattle is dying. ABC affiliate reporter there, Eric Johnson, uh, profiling the city's high property tax, uh, high property crime rates, homelessness and drug abuse all connected. He points to a court system and local officials who don't appear to believe that law enforcement is the answer to the problem. Yeah, plus enforced minimum wages and uh, raising the minimum wage. And they've actually even scared Amazon across the uh, the way to Bellevue there. Yeah, but so the question, I, I guess, is, Is this a case of projection by those Democrat mayors and uh, Paul suggesting that somebody who wants to establish a sensible immigration legal system is afraid of anyone when, in point of fact, it seems like they're afraid. They're afraid to do anything other than uh, essentially provide sanctuary and sanction for lawlessness in their cities because their constituents demand it. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, it, it's either projection or blatant hypocrisy and probably a little bit of both. And the other, I, the other thing, too, uh, the reaction from so many in the D.C. press corps, Tucker Carlson struck upon this. The left wasn't happy about Trump's offer. They were shocked and they were completely enraged. You know what this is, they said? It's dumping. Dumping. Like what you do with garbage or used truck tires in the woods. The headline of Mother Jones read, Donald Trump wants to dump asylum seekers on the streets of American cities, Democratic cities. 
busing people, wrote the Washington Post Greg Miller, to dump them in cities just to punish political rivals. In the view of Harry Siegel at the Daily Beast, quote, the White House wanted to dump refugees in sanctuary cities. Siegel called that idea nasty. At the same time, almost simultaneously, as if in concert, in fact, both CNN and MSNBC ran headlines accusing the White House of wanting to dump immigrants into cities. What does that sound like? As Tucker continues, it sounds like uh, racist, doesn't it? It's talking about dumping people. These are human beings, and I agree that they're human beings. So who is stoking fear or uh, paralyzed by fear, and who is engendering hate? And for what purpose? Going back to the projection, I mean, they are doing and saying everything that they accuse everybody else of, and let's not let it slide again that they had an opportunity to solve this problem, that they refused to put any sort of offer on the table when it was offered up by the president. Let's talk about Dreamers. Let's talk about DACA. Let's talk about immigration. And they said, absolutely not. We're going to offer nothing. We are not going to engage in this conversation, and now they're completely horrified by getting exactly what they wanted. For a more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by former Hewlett Packard CEO, former presidential candidate. Uh, she had a lot to say on this topic, and so many others uh, distinguished herself as a presidential candidate. Uh, she is Carly Fiorina. She's got a new book out, Find Your Way, Unleash Your Power and Highest Potential. Ms. Fiorina, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate Hi, Carly. it. Good morning, Dan and Carol. Please call me Carly. How okay. are you today? Thank you. It's uh, great to have you. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction to this uh, seeming intractable problem of uh, being a nation that welcomes immigrants, but being a nation that uh, of laws as well, particularly at the border. Well, you know, I think the word you just used is exactly right, intractable. And Honestly, one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I think people look at politics over decades and conclude, well, if they can't ever solve any problems, then I'm not capable of solving problems either. And we all are capable of solving the problems that impact us. But on the immigration issue specifically, I remember being in the Senate dining room the day that George W. Bush's push for comprehensive immigration reform went down. We could have solved it then. By the way, a lot of the left sank that proposal. Um, Obama didn't ever really try a legislative solution, although he campaigned on one. Uh, he tried, as you'll recall, the phone and the pen and executive hmm. order, et cetera. And now here we are. And while, as you pointed out, there's been a lot of back and forth. Uh, at one point, I think there was maybe legal do uh, status for DACA in return for $25 billion for the wall. The point is this problem continues to fester. And unfortunately, it is fodder, political fodder, for both sides. Unfortunately, it gets people fired up. It's arguable it even gets people out to vote. It raises money. I mean, I've seen so many fundraising emails from both sides. I kind of study them. Everyone's raising money on this issue, and it has been for a long time. But sadly, <laughs> the problem continues. And I have great empathy for people in cities who see that we're not taking care of our own and more uh, poor, pathetic unfortunate people are showing up and I have empathy for these people who pack up their kids and trek thousands of miles because they think there's going to be a better life. It's a terrible situation. And I hope that it is now getting to the point where people on both sides realize we actually have to buckle down and fix this problem because it's getting out of control. Carly, it seems like in your new book, um, Find Your Way, Unleash the Power of Your Highest Potential, that you're very focused on the individual. And Dan and I have been talking a little bit this morning about the focus on the individual on the right versus the collectivist. Um, you know, you're part of this intersectional, com immutable characteristics, you know, what your race determines who you are and all that. Do you think that immigration ties into that, to the, the fact that if they can keep people as part of this collective, then that gives the left more power and that they're actually not incentivized to solve this problem? 
Well, uh, first of all, just to comment on the individual, um, I have learned over and over in my life in all parts of the world with all kinds of people that every individual possesses enormous potential, usually more than they realize. And in particular, each of us has the potential to change the order of things for the better in our own sphere, our sphere of influence, our own family, our own business, our own place of work. And that so often people fail to unlock their own potential. They fail to realize their own power. And so things just don't get better. In fact, if you think about it for just one moment, this country, our constitution is based on the power of the individual. And in fact, yes, we've had to work very hard to make sure that we see all individuals, regardless of their color or their gender, for example, as having inalienable rights. And we've achieved tremendous progress in that regard. But the Constitution basically says the individual has rights. The individual is sovereign and works hard to prevent the collection, the concentration, the abuse of power by the selected few. My fundamental problem with the left, to the point of your question, is that the left seems to believe that some people are smarter than others, better than others, more capable of making decisions than others. And, those, and so therefore, some of us are going to decide for you, take care of you, make decisions for you. And I think that is the ultimate disrespect and disregard for the individual who has enormous um, power and potential, as my book suggests, and enormous problem-solving capacity. Uh, and I provide some how-to tools. But I do believe that this issue gets people riled up. This issue raises money. This issue arguably wins elections. And as George Washington told us in 1789, the trouble with political parties is they will come to care only about winning. And I do think we're seeing that sometimes on both sides. Uh, Joel Kotkin has an interesting piece in Quillette. Uh, Joel Kotkin, uh, academic president uh, at the Urban Futures, uh, president fellow in Urban Futures at Chapman University. Uh, the end of aspiration. And he he's, uh, sticks on home ownership in particular as uh, uh the metric that demonstrates the end of aspiration in America, the decline in home ownership among uh, younger people. He uh, also uh, cites uh, Thomas Piketty, who uh, rose to some renown with his book a couple of years ago that sort of ushered in a, a, a renewed uh, enthusiasm for socialism in part. Uh, he uh, writes, does cock, and this, uh, the, the uh, receding horizon is generating an even more feudalistic mentality among the young. Those with wealthy parents are far luckier to own a house and enter what one writer calls the funnel of privilege. And American millennials are increasingly counting on their inheritance for their retirement at a rate three times that of boomers. Among the youngest cohort, 18 to 22, more than 60 percent see inheritance as their primary source of wealth as they age. And this end of uh, end of aspiration coming in America to younger generations, perhaps that's a better way to discuss this topic than just capitalism versus socialism in a way that both of those terms have been redefined? You know, I do think that's an awfully grim prognosis, and I don't share it. Uh, I have a lot of young people who work uh, for me and with me. Uh, I encounter a lot of young people in the work that my foundation does, young people in all socioeconomic strata, young people of all kinds of ethnicity and background, and I don't see an end of aspiration. What I see is, as each generation must in some ways, uh, is a reflection on their part on the experiences and lessons of their elders. And so I think a lot of this end of home ownership is not – I don't aspire to have a good life or I don't aspire to make a difference or I don't aspire to um, have an impact. And in fact, I think a lot of young people want to have an impact in the world. I think some of it is, wow, I watched what happened during the Wall Street crash. I watched what happened in the real estate market. Everyone seems to know a story 
of someone who had, you know, put all of their aspiration in owning a home and then saw that that didn't work out. So I do think it's a very grim prognosis. I think um, this generation, the young generation, like every other generation, uh, you know, there are some who strive for more than others, but I would not condemn an entire generation in the way his thesis does. What's your uh, assessment of President Jobs, uh, uh, President Trump's job performance so far? Well, you know, I think President Trump was sent to Washington because he is a disruptor. I think people said, you know what? Uh, problems haven't gotten solved. Problems are festering. I don't care. Pick your problem. Debts and deficits, immigration, health care, veterans care. You, you can pick a problem that people have run on in political campaigns over the past 20 years. And people said, you know, it's not getting better. We need a disruptor. We need someone to, who's going to go and challenge the status quo and shake up the system and get things done. And so I think uh, where President Trump is now, he clearly has demonstrated his ability to disrupt the system, to challenge people's assumptions in really um, provocative and interesting ways. And you were just talking about one at the top of the hour. Okay, you want a sanctuary city? We're going to send illegal immigrants to you and see how you like it then. I mean, that's a really interesting way to change the dynamic. I think, of course, what the test for uh, his administration now is some of these problems need to get better. Uh, I, I hope, I believe that he and his administration are fully aware of that, but things need to get better because ultimately if you run on your ability to fix things, which was his campaign appeal, I alone can fix it. Ultimately you have to fix some things. You're certainly getting a lot of disruptors um, on the left as well certainly disruptive in a way that uh, I don't particularly appreciate, but I think that that's appealing to certain people on the left. Uh, having been a presidential candidate in a very crowded field before, if you were looking at the people on the left, what do you think they need to do to differentiate themselves within that <laughs> field and, and prove that they're a disruptor? Well, it's such an interesting question because I don't, to me, what I'm observing is there is no interest in distinguishing themselves. They all seem to be rushing as far left as possible. So, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have sort of put stakes in the ground about how left you have to be. And everyone seems to be rushing there. I mean, ama it's amazing to me that Beto O'Rourke is apologizing for his previous views on immigration, which basically were pretty sensible and pretty centrist, and now suddenly he's saying, no, 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 I, I would tear down the wall. And Buttigieg, so, he has to apologize for saying uh, all lives matter. That requires an apology I, today. I, I mean, so I find it really um, kind of amazing, self-destructive uh, on their part. I mean, I think it bodes well, very well, for Trump's reelection, that no matter who gets into the race, they all seem to believe that they must toe the same line. I get it. It's a primary and all of that stuff. But, boy, it's hard to come back for, I apologize for believing that we need to have strong laws in immigration to, gee, let's have some sensible laws and uh, solutions to a festering problem. What's your handle, uh, since she's a native of your home state there, California, what's your handle on Kamala Harris, who's perceived to be one of the front runners, I think she is. Yeah, you know, I think she, I, I think her uh, time, I haven't studied her extensively since she got into the race. Um, as you might expect, none of these candidates are particularly appealing to me or worthy of my study. On <laughs> right. the other hand, <laughs> right. um, on the other hand, what I would say is her uh, time as attorney general in California, I think there is a lot in there to please the progressive left, but I think there is a lot in there that may worry the progressive left as well as she came up uh, the ranks as a prosecutor. Um, she clearly is a uh, relatively skilled orator, uh, but I, I think she's going to have a tough time in many ways. She is Carly Fiorina, former CEO of HP, of presidential candidate in 2016, of course, and her book, 
Unleash your power and highest potential. Get it at Amazon.com and everywhere else, of course. Carly, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck with the book. Appreciate it.